Gordon Murray, who's the co-creator of the Vancouver Sun parody. Gordon will talk about why they produced the parody and where the case is. A New York Supreme Court judge said that slap suits short of a gun to the head, a greater threat to freedom of expression can be scarcely imagined. So that's what's at stake here is freedom of expression in Canada. To start off with, um, one of the reasons that we did this parody, as Brian mentioned, is because of media concentration in Canada. Um, <clears throat> Canada is one of the most concentrated media markets in the G8. Uh, there's basically three or four companies that control virtually all or the majority of the mainstream media in Canada. And it's even worse than that because within that, those three or four companies, that, that sounds like choice. There's three or four different places you can go for your news. But in fact, within, within these, there's, there's kind of mini monopolies because a lot of regions and types of media are actually dominated by one company. So for example, radio is dominated by Chorus. Newspapers are dominated by Can West. TV is dominated by CTV. So there's, there's a concentrations within concentrations. And specifically in BC, the concentration is much worse. Although Can West controls almost 50% of the daily newspaper circulation in Canada, it controls 84% of the daily newspaper circulation in BC, where it owns the Vancouver Sun, the Vancouver Province, and it also owns a whole string of weekly newspapers, including the uh, North Shore News, the Vancouver Courier, the, the Now Community Chain, overall 12 community papers as well as the uh, the main dailies in Vancouver. It also controls Global TV or owns Global TV which has by far the market leading newscast in Vancouver. It also controls Czech TV in Victoria and also uh, the, the uh, Times Colonist there. So Canadian press has estimated that in Vancouver Can West controls 70% of the news market. So they're more than just a leader. They set the agenda. They, they basically decide what's news and the rest follow. Um, but what does media concentration mean for those of us who want to know what's happening in the world? Well, having one corporation control or control the, a large portion of the news in Vancouver how it does have a significant impact on what we hear about the world. Um, there's a lot of things that, that uh, Can West has a particular agenda about. I, tonight I'm going to talk about Israel and Palestine. Um, there was a study done in Toronto by the, the Near East Culture and Educational Foundation that looked at the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, and the Can West flagship, the National Post, on their coverage of of uh, Palestine and Israel. And uh, they looked at all of the stories that those newspapers printed during 2004. And they looked at the headlines and, and first paragraphs of those stories to, because that's what most people read and that's where people get the sense of a story. And they found that there was bias in all of these publications, all of Canada's national publications. And they, one of the things they looked at specifically was the reporting of deaths of children. Um, and uh, so the one way that, that bias can come out is by portraying one side as, as the victim in a conflict, one side as the victim. And uh, so what happened with deaths of children was that is, the deaths of Israeli children were much more likely to be reported than the deaths of Palestinian children. So that, it, so that we got the sense that Israel is the victim. And the, the uh, Globe and Mail didn't do a great job. They were, they were biased. They were reporting Israeli children's deaths at four times the rate of Palestinian children's deaths in 2004. 
And actually the Toronto Star, which is considered a liberal newspaper, was even worse. They were reporting Israeli children's deaths at eight times the rate. They were eight times more likely to report an Israeli child's death than a Palestinian child's death during 2004. But the National Post, what you can, can you say? They're in a class by themselves. They were 89 times more likely to report an Israeli child's death than a Palestinian child's death. So they gave a sense that, that four times as many Israeli children had been killed in 2004 than Palestinian children, when in fact, Betzalem, the Israeli human rights group, went and investigated and found that in fact 22 <coughs> times as many Palestinian children were killed as Israeli children. So that's the kind of bias that you, that you can find in the media. I just want to give one more example. Uh, Jan a more recent one that you might be aware of. January 6, 2009, um, during the assault on Gaza, Israel tanks and warplanes shelled two UN schools and killed 44 Palestinians. Um, January 7th, you think you might be able to find out something about that story in your local newspaper. Vancouver Sun, your paper of record, first page. Rivers could flood, officials warn. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about dog bites man story. We're not even talking about man bites dog story, we're talking about dog could bite man story. <laughs> and that's the headline. Nothing, no mention of Gaza on the front page. So then we go to the Canada and the World section. The only mention is Gaza ceasefire plan gains traction on page B1, Canada and World. B2 nothing, B3 nothing, B4 nothing, B5 nothing, B6. The story of the shelling of UN schools, the headline is Pressure Mounts for Ceasefire. So that gives you an idea why you may not know, or your friends or your family may not know what's going on in Israel and Palestine and Gaza and Vancouver. But this case is not, does not occur in a vacuum. There is a concerted effort in Canada and internationally to squelch, to reduce, to limit the debate on Israel and Palestine. And I'll just mention a couple of examples. Um, at McMaster University, the, uh, when the students tried to organize an Israeli Apartheid Week event last, last year, the McMaster administration said you cannot use the words Israel and Apartheid on a banner. Um, in, in Victoria, the Peace Education, or sorry, Peace Environment and Justice website, they reprinted an article from the Toronto Sun, which was originally titled, We Should Nuke Iran, but somebody went through and just changed Iran to Israel and the pre in, in this article and just, but included it verbatim. So it was, it was said, we should nuke Israel. And uh, they've now been brought against the Human Rights Tribunal by B'nai Brith. I just wanted to close with a, a quote, which was one of my favorites, from Edward Galliano. What is the use of writing, if not to challenge the blockade imposed by the system on the dissenting message? That's why we did this parody, and that's why we, we, it's important to get this message out. Thank you. Deborah Campbell, who's an author and journalist on the Middle East, will speak. Deborah Campbell will discuss the problems of trying to get real and thorough coverage in the Canadian media. We're also talking about the siege on media freedom, which goes hand in hand with things like the siege on Gaza. Because when we talk about the Middle East, what we're talking about in a lot of ways is the parallel information war that's going on. Um, how, what voices do we hear? What voices do we not hear? What perspectives are heard and, w and which ones are silenced? Um, I've spent uh, the last eight years or so covering the Middle East um, in countries from Palestine to uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Egypt, uh, Iran. 
And uh, there's certainly a lot of difficulty in getting out stories about the Middle East generally, but it really nothing really compares to, to doing stories on, on Palestine. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes when you're doing this doing this kind of journalism and what goes into it. Um, so in 2002, I wrote a book about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I had spent a lot of time uh, living in the region. Uh, the book basically was motivated by the fact that in the early 90s, I was a student of Middle Eastern studies at Tel Aviv University. And uh, in that time, in the years that, that passed, I had a lot of questions about the perspectives that were presented uh, in my studies and was very interested in uh, exploring the perspectives that were not, uh, certainly not, not taught in my classes, but also not part of the media that I was reading, um, not seen on the news and the radio and so on. So uh, sometime in, uh, in 2001, I decided to go about 10 years after my, my studies and um, and write a book on the perspectives that that I wasn't getting a chance to hear. So I went in with a lot of questions about that, and I wanted to write also a kind of kaleidoscope of views and not simply choose one perspective and write a kind of polemic. There's a, there's a lot of that out there. I'm not not saying it's not useful, but it wasn't the kind of thing that I was hoping to do. So instead, I wanted to talk to um, Israelis. Um, uh, that were, say, conscientious objectors to serving in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, I wanted to talk also to the settlers themselves who were building settlements on Palestinian land and hear what they had to say in their own words. Um, and strangely enough, they're, they're so influential yet rarely quoted. You rarely do we get to hear what they actually have to say. And I, of course I wanted to hear the voices of average Palestinians living on the ground and, and get a chance to get close to their experience. Um, a lot of the work that I do is, is immersive journalism where I go and live in places and stay there for, for months at a time and, uh, and live with people there because it's my feeling that you can't really uh, get, get a sense for uh, what's happening with them unless you experience at least something of how they live. So whether it was sitting in their homes while um, Israeli tanks were firing on rock throwers um, in their early teens outside their homes or um, um, spending time in Gaza um, uh, while um, tanks were pointing their their um, weapons at us as we were, you know, walking down the street, um, I got a, I got a much more uh, close up view of uh, of the conflict than I'd had um, either as a student, not very many kilometers away, or as uh, certainly as a media viewer, media, media consumer. And I like to I like to always say that I became a journalist because I don't I don't uh, I don't want to rely on the press for information, and probably this is the one story where you least want want to do that. Uh, so this this book came out, and I was very pleased uh, about it, and and. Um, and then I, I started noticing a, a strange phenomenon that, that started happening. And uh, so I would have a big interview lined up with a major TV network, and it would be suddenly canceled. And, and then I'd get a, a call from a, an excited historian who um, was reviewing my book and was very excited about it for, for a major literary review. And then I'd get a sad little email from him a couple weeks later saying the editor had spiked it, and um, the editor had told him I'd had, uh, I particularly had had far too much in, uh, attention already. Um, so he was confused as to why she'd assigned him the review in the first place, but maybe she'd hoped it was going to be a really bad review. Um, so then when I would be on, on television or, or the radio, the producers would invariably come up to me and say, um, we were so scared to have you on. And I, I started wondering, you know, why were you so frightened to have me on? I, I'm not particularly radical. I'm just presenting what I saw. It's kind of, I wrote kind of a literary documentary um, and, and decidedly not a, not a polemic for the reasons that, I, that I've said already. Um, and it became apparent that it, it had a lot to do with the, the fact that I was telling human stories, first of all, about Palestinians, and that I was telling um, also about stories about Israelis that refused to go along <laughs> with the occupation. It had a lot to say about um, what it was actually like to be a save, for instance, a soldier, uh, and um, fighting against civilians. And I, w I was writing um, these kind 
kind of uh, stories that we don't actually get to hear. Um, so for me, because I, I believe in immersive journalism and, and personal up close experience with the stories that that I cover, um, this was a really valuable lesson for me as well because it was it was um, you know the subtitle of my book was Encounters in the Promised Land, and for me this was encounters with um, with with the media censorship around Palestine, and and it was uh, in a lot of ways a, a gift. It was a real education for me, uh, and certainly I I understood very clearly that I wasn't going to be able to um, find a. a, a a, pla a place in Canadian media in terms of a, a nice staff job with, you know, health benefits and and so on and so forth. Um, but I also realized that I, that I, I I would never be able to do my work should I make that kind of agreement um, because basically those kinds of stories um, just don't get published. And um, so I continued to do independent journalism. So just to talk a little bit about coverage of of the Gaza uh, invasion that happened recently. Um, I'll keep it very brief, but um, I think it's really important to understand the media strategy that went behind that. Uh, the the UK and Israeli papers were commenting on how the media strategy was prepared six months before the invasion. and. Uh, long before um, the the context was set out that Hamas had done this or that, and th it, it was it was their um, responsibility. Um, the 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 actual um, strategy was set forth, and I have a quote here. Um, if I can find it from Dan Gillerman, who was um, made the head of that um, PR strategy, where he um, commends. The, the whole apparatus on working together to get the message out very effectively. Um, and of course they did. Um, so even, uh, especially in, in the US and the UK, I was in Chicago and New York for most of the war and so I sp spent a lot of time watching the US news and pretty much point for point followed the, 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 um, the Israeli um, talking points such that, of course, I Israel was the victim um, and Israel was responding in self-defense. As, as the New York Times wrote in its editorial on December 29th, um, saying that Hamas must bear responsibility for ending a six-month ceasefire this month with a barrage of rockets into Israeli territory. Um, now, the paper of record, of course, had, had reported uh, itself that the ceasefire was broken on November 4th by Israel. Um, but of course, November 4th was also the one day when nobody is really going to pay much attention because um, that was the day of the U.S. presidential election. So you can see how much thought goes into timing uh, on these things. Um, so it was actually across the board only only in in the US and Canada there was only really one prominent media figure who stood up to say something about it and that was um, a, a satirist John Stewart on the Daily Show and in their first episode of the new year he uh, he asked um, why does Israel feel that they have to at react so strongly right now and then he said, I get it. Israel isn't sure that the new administration is going to grant them carte blanche in the bombing department. So they're getting it in now before the January 20th hope and change deadline. Time is running out. It's like a civilian carnage Toyotathon. And uh, even though he was alone in saying it, something is afoot when Jon Stewart starts um, putting this kind of information into the mind of his of his viewers, um, most of whom are better informed on average than the viewers of um, the corporate news media, and, and studies have actually proven that. Uh, so that was followed um, not long after by an Onion article, uh, Onion being a satirical American newspaper, um, with the headline, Vacation to Israel Cancelled Due to History of Israel. Um, <laughs> and it's quite funny, so I suggest you look it up. Um, so the good news is, is that even where journalism is failing, satire is still alive. And the good news is that even when um, we have a hard time uh, getting our, our um, 
getting the truth across, that it's still worth it to speak up for those who don't have a voice, um, because ultimately that's the point. Okay, thank you.